begin by saying that the main grant that supported this conference was from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, they have a conference grant program. Um, and we also have a number of other uh, supporters and funders, um, Northeastern's Humanity Center, Toxics Action Center, Protect, which is our super fund research program, Silent Spring Institute, and Testing for Peas. Um, to get a thing like this together, to bring all these folks here, to make all the connections, takes a lot of work. And here's our wonderful list of the organizing committee. They've done tremendous work. It's been such a, a pleasure to work with them. We've learned from each other. We've made new friendships, deepened old friendships. And I'm not going to read the list of people. Um, most of these people you're going to hear speak anyway. Um, so we're going to avoid listing lots of people. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it is sometimes um, impossible to ignore some people. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to our grants administrator at the Social Science and Environmental Health Research Institute, Stephanie Knudsen, who's really been on top of all the arrangements. Um, and also to our lead research assistant, Warren Richter, and to Liz Boxer and Sukhan Diallo, and that NIWA co-op students who have been supported uh, by our NIEHS undergraduate training grant and by our NSF uh, undergraduate training grant. Uh, endless details that these folks have dealt with uh, to make this thing happen. So at this unprecedented conference, you're going to really hear uh, the widest possible range of perspectives on PFASs. You're going to see the people who've been really on the front lines of all the important work in every sector have a lot of time to network, including at lunches and dinners. A very special greeting, though, to the community groups. The affected residents have been the pioneers in bringing this to our attention. They're the people who live with this in their water, in their yards, um, considering the, the health effects to their families and worried about what's going to happen to their communities in the future. So they give us strength as the rest of us uh, to go on. So really special appreciation to them. And of course, a special thanks to our keynote speaker, Dr. Lynn Birnbaum, the director of NIEHS. Uh, she has, as well as the Institute overall, been a tremendous resource uh, in leadership and credibility and uh, science that's helped bring what we know about PFAS uh, forward. So this has just been a wonderful thing for us to, uh, to work with her. Um, I want to also mention um, that it's good to know who people are. So I would just like to have a show of hands of people who are from the affected communities, from other environmental organizations, from government and military, from science, all the sciences, social, life, natural, students, chemical industry, supply <laughs> <laughs> chain manufacturing, <coughs> journalists and authors, legal, and anybody else who I didn't mention, just yell out what the sector is. Artists. Okay. Since November, I've been in a lot of demonstrations. Um, probably a lot of you have too. And one of my favorite chants there is, this is what democracy looks like. And it's very self-evident. Uh, but I think that what we have here from this assortment of people, uh, this is what science democracy looks like. You're all doing democracy in action. And I think we also have to give a very special shout out to our courageous friends at EPA who are trying to do their work even in light of a hostile administrator. And I'm proud of our Region 1 staff who had this demonstration in front of their offices uh, just last month. Uh, just a little bit about who we are. Social Science and Environmental Health Research Institute um, has a, a grant on performing compounds um, on KFAS. We've been working uh, on this for a while. Um, we are a group of faculty, postdocs, uh, graduate students, and undergraduates. Um, we're the only specialized center that I know of that works at that intersection of social science and environmental health. Uh, we have a lot of research projects and grants from NIEHS, from NSF, uh, JPB Foundation, uh, some other private foundations, and uh, we also have an NIEHS training program to further those efforts. Um, we've been working together with our co-sponsors for a long time, 
at my previous research grant that morphed into this, uh, research institute that morphed into this, has worked with Toxics Action Center for decades, uh, and the Silent Spring Institute for a decade and a half. Um, we, we hope people visit our website learn more about us. Uh, we particularly have our PFAS lab group where we've been working on studying contamination sites, studying the history of discovery, of policy, of regulation, of organizing. Um, we've developed our website um, that you can see at pfasproject.org uh, and, and you can find out all the different things, lots of up-to-date news, and we've developed this uh, contamination site database, which you'll, you'll hear a lot more about. Uh, we've also helped affected communities to link up with each other and collaborate on research proposals with uh, our other co-sponsors who are here. Um, Silent Spring Institute, Harvard School of Public Health, Testing for Peas, Toxics Action Center, Mass Breast Cancer Coalition, Green Cape, and Sierra Club. Uh, I'm not going to read this list of names either. This is just the, the large number of people in the PFAS lab group who have been doing all this work with us together. And this is a screenshot of our website uh, that shows you um, some of that up-to-date news. And as I said, we have the contamination site tracker where we have uh, lots of media coverage and dates of discoveries and levels of contamination, regulatory responses, pretty much everything you need to know. It's constantly being updated. We just learned in the last week of new information. Um, and when you look at that, you know, this is a, a screenshot of what it looks like a little bit. We were tremendously happy to have the Environmental Working Group express interest in this, and we've been so pleased to work together with them uh, to use our data and um, the EPA's UCMR3 data to develop the map. Um, most of you have probably seen this by now. It was launched on uh, June 8th, but our, our, our work there um, with Soren Brunquist and Bill Walker and other EWG colleagues has just been tremendous. This is a, a wonderful resource. We've got a lot of press coverage. We have computers out in the hallway for you to try this out and to see what it looks like. Uh, again, any news, uh, any data that we don't have on our contamination site database, we welcome that as well. So the map has two layers, our database and the UCMR database. One of the things I want to point out, um, when I called out the list of different parties here, I want to make the case that in a lot of work on chemicals that we see today, flame retardants was another example that we've worked on before. Uh, many of the same people <coughs> have worked on flame retardants as well, including Green Science Policy Institute. It takes a multi-sector alliance. It takes all these different parties to make progress. And we've seen progress in both of those areas, from the communities to the regulators to the scientists to the local government to the manufacturers, the lawyers and the journalists. It really takes this huge number of people to make it work. And uh, I want to also remind you that this is nothing new. Um, when we look around and try to figure out where did this set of contaminants come from that we're now so recently concerned with, we want to realize that a lot of this information was known very early. Uh, and this is one of those um, slides that you're not really supposed to read. You're supposed to see how many different time points there were in this EWG list of what we knew and when. And the key thing is that in 1961, we knew of animal health effects in 1962, of human health effects. Uh, and among other things, uh, DuPont actually gave its workers cigarettes laced with Teflon to smoke and to see what that would do to them. Obviously, this is way before we had any protections for that kind of research. So we knew a lot, but really it wasn't until 1981 that most of this hit the fan. Um, and we saw DuPont and 3M providing EPA with results of laboratory studies showing uh, about the animal health effects and then beginning to show um, that there were birth defects among women in the DuPont plan, and DuPont actually um, <coughs> say in 1981 that anybody who worked in the Teflon unit should talk to the doctors there before thinking about getting pregnant. So clearly a lot was known when you give those kinds of warnings. So it's not a new thing. Um, but it, it is um, recent successes uh, have been here. We, we continually um, have to update this map because the states have begun to lower their levels and they're toying with even lower levels and even uh, going beyond advisory levels to regulatory levels. 
So we can view this as some kind of a success. <coughs> we can view it as a success if the FDA delisted several of the food uh, wrapping, uh, chemicals used in food wrapping. And this is something which uh, is less important for what it was because they were already stop stopping using those. Uh, but the fact that it was done by a particular process um, where the organizing potential of, of going to uh, FDA with um, this kind of petition is a very, very important thing that we should learn uh, to use in the future. There's also a lot of potential for consumer action. Um, we've seen successes in limiting PFASs in some products, just like with flame retardants. Um, but ultimately, what the sociologist Andy Sa says, you can't shop your way to safety. You can organize your way to safety, and that means getting products safer for everybody so we don't have to spend all our time reading the labels. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say uh, is that I would like to have us consider that we are really redefining the notion of the emerging contaminants. Uh, we talk often about legacy versus emerging contaminants. We think of the PCBs and DDT uh, as legacy and then the flame retardants and the PFASs as emerging. But when I showed you that we knew a lot in the 1960s, early 1960s, these are not emerging. Uh, they have really been around for uh, a long time and it's not such a useful dichotomy anymore. These are contaminants that have really emerged very well, very uh, successfully, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of research to establish what we know about them. It's not difficult anymore to get funded and published about this. We have knowledge of ecological and animal and human health effects. So uh, I just want to use that as a bit of an intro. Uh, and now we get on to a couple of housekeeping things. Um, video, um, we are doing our own video for this. We're going to post things on YouTube. There are a couple of <coughs> makers who have, by prior uh, permission with certain speakers, arranged to videotape them. Those filmmakers are using uh, red yellow uh, stickers. Uh, we're all very color-coded, um, so if you see somebody with a red dot, it means that you shouldn't be taking any photos, uh, even of them. Um, and we want to make sure that people are uh, aware of this. If anybody has not yet told us they don't want to be um, filmed or photoed, you know, please let us know. <coughs> Um, online, you'll um, have a form to fill out with feedback that will help us know a lot about what the conference has been to you, and it even asks, would you like to think of future get-togethers? Uh, some nuts and bolts, the bathrooms are right outside. Um, there's food, as you saw along the wall next to the registration table. I do want to uh, remind you that uh, at lunchtime, we have a uh, special time set aside for community groups to network, and uh, they're going to be upstairs at 440. Um, please, everybody, lay off the food until they get there so they have time to get their food and get upstairs. Dinner is going to be on your own. Um, some groups will, will form uh, if you have special interests, if you'd like to get people together around, um, put a note at the table out front. And um, otherwise, Lauren Richter will be walking whoever would like to go over to the Prudential Center to the Ely, a uh, very upscale food court type place. Uh, and that will be um, a, a nice walk after this day. So I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. Planning committee, have I left any housekeeping out? Hashtag. All right, well, um, with <laughs> this the hashtag, for hashtag uh, if you're tweeting out uh, PFAS2017, PFAS2017. So let everybody know about this. Um, this is the mural um, on Church Street in Harvard Square. Um, the precautionary principle <laughs> project put this together, and the um, precautionary principle is listed across the bottom indication of harm, not proof of harm, is our call to action. And uh, on this 55th anniversary of uh, Silent Springs publication, the New Yorker is, is reproducing all those uh, one by one as they were initially published in the New Yorker. Um, you may see on the, the left, Rachel Carson was right. So we hope you enjoy the conference, and now it's my pleasure to bring up Laurel Shader, a research scientist at Silent Spring Institute.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Laurel Shader. I'm a research scientist at Silent Spring Institute. We're a nonprofit research organization uh, dedicated to understanding links between everyday chemical exposures and health, with a particular focus on women's health and breast cancer. And I'd like to echo Phil's welcome. It's been many months in the planning, and I'm really excited that so many of you have chosen to spend these two days with us. Uh, so my goal here in the next 15 minutes is to provide an overview um, on PFASs, or highly fluorinated chemicals. Some of this will probably be familiar to all of you since you're all at this conference, uh, but this will hopefully just give us a framework, some common themes and context to connect with the future presentations later on. And then thinking about what points to make um, in my overview here, I wanted to talk about some of the characteristics that make highly fluorinated chemicals particularly unique and challenging. One characteristic, of course, is their persistence. So these are synthetic, man-made chemicals that are characterized by having many carbon-fluorine bonds. And these are some of the strongest bonds in, in nature, and so these chemical structures just really don't break down under normal conditions. Another characteristic are their complexity. A recent study said there are over 3,000 PFASs on the global market. So while all of these chemicals are highly fluorinated, um, there is a wide range of different chemical structures. Um, that means that these chemicals have a wide range of um, in, uh, behavior in the environment and potential toxicity. Um, and the third characteristic is their versatility. When we talk about flame retardants, we can just say they're flame retardants and you know kind of what they're used for. But when we're talking about highly fluorinated chemicals, they're, they are very useful because they are used in so many different products, but it does make it hard to come up with a, a quick way to summarize what they're used for and to characterize the most important exposure pathways. So we are all exposed to PFASs in our daily lives. These chemicals are used widely in many consumer products. Um, such as uh, stain-resistant carpet and upholstery, waterproof jackets, uh, floor waxes and ski waxes, uh, Teflon-coated non-stick cookware, certain grease-proof food packaging, such as microwave popcorn bags and pizza boxes, um, even certain dental floss, which always seems to surprise people. And there's others, this list could go on, cosmetics, uh, paints, um, adhesives, and so on. Um, we led a study earlier this year, some of my other co-authors are here, um, that showed that many uh, fast food wrappers, particularly those grease-proof uh, wax, paper paper, wax paper consistency wrappers, um, contain highly fluorinated chemicals. Um, and for the study, we were able to use a new screening method developed by Graham Peasley at University of Notre Dame um, that allowed us to rapidly screen for the presence of total fluorine as a marker for PFASs. Um, so while everyone basically is exposed to highly fluorinated chemicals in our daily lives, of course some communities are particularly <coughs> impacted, and I know that's what brings many of you here today. Um, some of the most common sources of drinking water contamination include AFFF, so aqueous film forming foams, or class B firefighting foams. These are used uh, to train for or to put up fuel fires. So they often end up in groundwater near airports, military bases, and fire training areas. High levels have also been detected near certain production facilities, and we'll hear a lot today, for instance, about the DuPont facility um, in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and the, um, the, the known and sort of emerging contaminants at, at, the, at the site. Um, there are other industries that don't necessarily make um, fluorinated chemicals, but incorporate them into the products that they're producing. So for instance, in Hoosick Falls, um, the contamination there with C8 was linked to uh, a factory that uh, produced many products such as um, Teflon-coated fiberglass products. Um, and then there are other common types of sources, such as waste disposal sites, for instance, landfills, or places where biosolids or sludge are landified as well as wastewater. Uh, this is from a study that came out last year from Elsie Sunderland's group at Harvard, and we'll hear more from Elsie this afternoon. Uh, this drew upon the EPA's UCMR3 data, and we'll hear more about that as well. Um, this tested large public water supplies throughout the U.S., and the, the main, one of the main findings was that large public water supplies were more likely to have detectable levels of PFASs if they were in the same large watershed area as a major uh, production facility, a military fire training site, uh, an airport certified to use these firefighting foams, or a number of wastewater treatment plants. Uh, for my own work at Silent Spring Institute, we focused a lot on Cape Cod drinking water quality. 
Um, and the results of our work, coupled with the UCMR data, have shown that some of the public and private drinking water wells in the Cape have been impacted by AFFF from a county fire training area, a municipal airport, and a, a military base. And we'll hear more about, um, about the experience of a town on Cape Cod this afternoon. And we've also found lower levels of uh, fluorinated chemicals in private wells, even in areas not near one of these major sources, and we associate those with uh, septic system discharges, so just household wastewater can be a source of low, level, low levels of these contaminants. Um, so in the early 2000s, um, scientists began to recognize that these contaminants were um, getting out into the environment and not just in urban areas or near a production facility, but in far, far off uh, remote regions such as in the Arctic. Um, some PFAS can bioaccumulate, so they can be taken up into um, organisms, and some can biomagnify. So that means that uh, organisms higher on the food web at the top of the food chain um, can end up with higher levels in their bodies. For instance, polar bears or bald eagles or people. Um, Biomonitoring by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has shown that over 98% of Americans have traces of PFASs in their blood. So if you've heard of any specific highly fluorinated chemicals, it's probably one of these two, uh, PFOS and PFOA, or what we call long chain uh, highly fluorinated chemicals. So you can see the blue uh, zigzag line there, that's showing the carbon backbone. All of those corners represent a carbon atom. And these are, are compounds where all the, the, the carbons are fully fluorinated. Um, the, the tail on the left side is water and oil insoluble, and then there can be different pieces on the right side highlighted in green um, that make these compounds also water soluble. Um, so there's different definitions for exactly what's a long chain compound, but different for the sulfonates and carboxylates, but this is kind of the basic structure. Um, and it's important to note, this is kind of simplifying things because there are also other chemicals related to PFOS and PFOA that can be converted into them either in the environment or in our bodies. So we used to call these chemicals PFCs, and we've kind of made our lives more complicated by calling them PFASs. The whole name is per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is a big mouthful, and it's been a little confusing, I think, to make this transition. But the reason why it's important to say the long name, or at least just PFAS, is that uh, PFCs alone, or perfluorinated chemicals, just include some chemicals like PFOS, where all the carbons are fully fluorinated, um, and it leaves out polyfluorinated chemicals that have many carbon fluorine bonds, but you can see on the right there are H's, those are hydrogen atoms, and so that's not a fully fluorinated chemical. So per and poly um, represents both, and so it's a broader umbrella to bring in all the relevant compounds. Uh, so, um, PFAS and PFOA are no longer produced in the U.S. Um, due to concerns about toxicity and bioaccumulation and persistence. Uh, in 2002, 3M announced they were phasing out the production of PFOS. Uh, PFOA production has been phased out under a stewardship program uh, uh, led by the EPA. Internationally, PFOS has been added to Annex B of the Stockholm Convention for, for persistent organic pollutants. That means that its uh, production is restricted, although not entirely eliminated. And PFOA has been nominated for listing and is kind of working its way through the process. The EPA does not have any drinking water standards for PFOS, PFOA, or other highly fluorinated chemicals. That means there's no enforcement and there's no ongoing mandatory um, monitoring required by public water supplies. Uh, there are guidelines. Um, in 2006, EPA lowered its guidelines, so made it more restrictive, um, going from 200 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion of PFOS and 400 for PFOA down to 70 parts per trillion. So overnight, there were public water supplies across the country that were no longer meeting this new guideline. And we'll hear a lot about that um, later in the conference. Um, there are no federal guidelines for other PFASs, although there are a couple at the state level. Um, some states have taken it upon themselves to create their own lower guidelines. For instance, Vermont's guideline is 20 parts per trillion for both PFOS and PFOA combined. Uh, New Jersey has had a guideline of 40 nanograms per liter for many years and has a draft standard of 14 nanograms per liter. I'm not going to talk about health effects. There's a whole session later this morning. But I did want to mention that um, in the documentation for the draft New Jersey, uh, standard, they noted effects on mammary gland development, 
um, and suggested that the target serum level was actually below the median level in the general population. Um, and this is a particular concern for us at Silence Brain Institute. We have a, a focus on breast cancer. And we think that changes in mammary gland development um, indicate types of chemicals that might heighten uh, risk for breast cancer. So what often happens when we identify chemicals that are of concern is that we shift from using ones that we know are bad to other ones that we often don't have full information about toxicity and environmental transport. Um, so one class of replacement compounds are called short chain. They look a whole lot like PFOS and PFOA. They're just shorter. Um, these, you know, figure they say, well, these are, you know, have a short half-life in the human body. Half-life doesn't mean they're breaking down. It just has to do with how long your body holds on to them. Um, the long chain compounds are, have especially long half-lives on the order of years. Um, some of these replacement compounds have a half-life on the order of a month. So that's shorter than the long chain, but still as long compared to other chemicals of concern, such as bisphenol A. Um, so the vast majority of the science on highly fluorinated chemicals has focused specifically on PFOS and PFOA, but we do have some information about uh, these short chain PFASs. We don't have time to go into the details of these, um, but there has been research to show that they can have similar biological activity based on lab-based um, cell uh, in vitro testing. Um, they are not as well removed during drinking water treatment using granular activated carbon as the long chains. Um, they seem to have different patterns in terms of which organs in the body they accumulate in. This was a new study that, that showed that, um, that the shorter chains were actually, for instance, more likely to accumulate in the brains of um, rodents that were tested. Um, and they're more likely to accumulate in shoots and fruits of plants. Um, and we often hear this kind of dichotomy between, okay, the long chains have been phased out and now uh, the replacements are all short chains. And I want to emphasize that there are many replacement compounds. Um, Gen X and Adona are two um, PFOA replacement compounds. And you'll see that they have a long carbon chain, but it's interrupted by oxygens. And so technically it's not long chain because those carbons aren't all connected. And there is some potential for the, the molecules to fracture at those sites. Um, but it's, it's not a simple matter of it just being a shorter version of the, the long chain compounds. And then the AFFF firefighting foam is actually a really complex mixture of compounds as well. And you can see at the bottom they have, again, some of these long carbon chains that are interrupted with sulfur, nitrogen, and other elements. Um, I mentioned already that the terminology is a little tricky when we, talk, when we come to talk about PFASs. We don't call them PFCs anymore. Um, I've seen different definitions for what PFAS is. The poly doesn't always get in incorporated. And when we're, as consumers, say, trying to avoid buying products that have fluorinated chemicals, we might see something that says PFOA free, and you might think, oh good, it doesn't have those bad fluorinated chemicals. But all it means is that it doesn't have PFOA specifically, and there might be other fluorinated chemicals. And I've been trying to keep an eye on uh, different retailer and manufacturer um, promises to stop using or reduce their use of fluorinated chemicals. And I always feel like there's some ambiguity because of this uh, terminology. So some scientists have said, well, this whole class of compounds really should be treated together. They're all persistent. They share certain chemical characteristics. Uh, the Green Science Policy Institute led uh, the, this effort in 2015 to, uh, to mobilize scientists to call on eliminating the production and use of PFASs and finding safer alternatives. And this was signed by scientists um, from many different countries. Something that I think about as a scientist, you know, we, there's over 3,000 PFASs on the global market. So we'll never catch up if we're trying to just study one chemical at a time. We'll never catch up with regulations if we're just treating one chemical at a time. So far, we've really only dealt with two, and there's over 3,000. Um, and so there's kind of a, a conflict between taking a precautionary approach and saying, okay, let's just not use these chemicals as much. We have concerns about all of them with a need from some people to say like, okay, well, show us that the short chains are, are not safe. Um, when our fast food packaging paper came out earlier this year, there were legislators who were interested in introducing legislation in their states, and they said, well, but how do we know the short chains aren't safe? Um, and so, you know, there's really some just preliminary evidence, and I think we do need to fill some of the gaps in our knowledge, but also avoid the trap of just endlessly trying to characterize the ones that we know about because they're just simply too many. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap up. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about our research at Silence Brain Institute, we have a website where we post all of our research studies along with fact sheets and press releases. Um, and we keep it updated. Um, and here I am at Highly Coordinated Compound Conference. So welcome and thanks so much. Uh, my name is Sylvia Brody. I'm the executive director of the Toxics Action Center, and um, I wanted to share some background on our organization, or one of the co-hosting organizations today, and give a little bit of additional context before we move into our keynote speaker. Um, so we were founded uh, back in 1987 in response to a toxic problem in Woburn, Massachusetts, where W.R. Grace and other companies dumped toxic chemicals into the ground. And um, you know, as many of you know, that contamination led to more than a, uh, more than a dozen children getting leukemia, and many of them died. And today, the evidence linking environmental pollution with high levels of asthma, cancer, learning disabilities, and reproductive disorders is growing. However, it was really in Woburn where that link was first established so starkly. And the high-profile tragedy in Woburn, along with a series of other wake-up calls playing out in communities across the country made it clear that to prevent environment, environmental threats, not only do we need scientists and experts um, and knowledge, but we also need to build political power for our communities. And nowhere was that more clear than in Woburn. The concern there that polluted water caused childhood cancer was mostly a private concern for each of those suffering families until parents and sick kids began running into each other miles from Woburn in the child cancer ward at Mass General Hospital. And that's when they realized that this wasn't actually a private family tragedy. It was a community-wide problem, and they planned a meeting in a church community room to talk about what to do. And of course, a book and a movie were made um, about uh, the tragedy in Woburn that really raised the visibility of, this, um, of the case. And ultimately, this was the first lawsuit that linked health concerns to pollution. And in 1987, Toxics Action Center was created to provide assistance and guidance to residents throughout Massachusetts facing problems like the parents in Woburn and the families in Woburn experienced. And at the time, we were called the Massachusetts Campaign to Clean Up Hazardous Waste. Since our founding, we've expanded throughout the New England region, today supporting uh, 10 staff supporting offices in all six New England states. And um, we provide information, uh, a network of experts and activists, community organizing tra trainings and side-by-side on-the-ground assistance to communities in need, from knowing how environmental laws work on paper to how they work in practice, to making connections with attorneys, epidemiologists, and environmental professionals, to organizing conferences um, and movement-building events, uh, to providing campaign and leadership trainings we operate like a crisis hotline, the 911 for the environmental movement here in New England. And our staff travel out to meet with neighbors around living room tables, helping build consensus around common goals, helping them develop a plan to get there, and training on a curriculum of skills needed in a community organizing campaign. And over our history, we've worked with more than 900 community groups all across the New England region, representing more than 20,000 individuals that we've directly trained. And we have learned a lot over this experience the past 30 years. Um, the first thing we've learned, as, as, you know, as we all know too well, decades after these disasters, in, like the one in Woburn, like Love Canal, our dark legacy of petrochemical pollution in this country continues to threaten our health and the environment. Phil, of course, talked about the EWG and Northeastern uh, report last week, this map um, that found perfluorinated chemicals in drinking water systems in 27 states and tap water supplies of 15 million people. Out here in New England, of course, we were horrified to read about DuPont's egregious contamination of water supplies in Ohio and West Virginia. Little did we know that similar threats were lurking right here in our own backyards. 
that these chemicals are literally found almost everywhere. And over the next two days, we're going to hear from community leaders from more than a dozen communities all across the country sharing personally how they've been impacted by drinking water contaminated by PFAS, how their families and children have been impacted. One story we'll hear a little bit about, um, but not from community members themselves, is from North Bennington, Vermont. Um, this past year, Toxics Action Center uh, worked closely with residents in North Bennington whose drinking water was poisoned by C8 chemicals leaked from the ChemFab Corporation, which is now owned by St. Cobain Performance Plastics. And I wanted to share a little bit of their story in part because um, none of the citizen leaders could be here. Many of them were actually so sick that they just weren't able to make the trip. And um, this is a, a photo of Sandy, Sandy Sumner. He remembered black smoke belching from the smokestack of the factory just over the hill, um, but didn't think much of it. He hadn't ever heard of PFOA when a state official knocked on his door and asked to test his drinking water well. And he just happened to be working at home in his basement woodworking shop, and so he said yes. And when the results came back, uh, his well was found with more than 100 times the advisory limit of PFOA. Uh, in Vermont, and, and he didn't know what to do, but he knew that he had to take action. The second thing we've learned uh, is that when powerful companies will go to great lengths to avoid responsibility for their messes, and government agencies charged with protecting our health and the environment are often too slow to act. Despite all this research linking PFAS to cancer, thyroid disease, and more, uh, you know, as we know, chemical manufacturers lobbied for and won loopholes in the Safe Drinking Water Act. And there's no requirement for communities to test for this chemical, much less to clean it up. This uh, article is about the Taconic Plastic Company in Petersburg, New York, which first alerted the State Department of Environmental Conservation and county health officials back in 2005 about its discovery of PFOA in groundwater around its plant. But there was never, sort of, never any type of public announcement. In fact, it was 11 years until contamination was made public in a news story just last year. And only after that news coverage did lo local and state officials take action. Of course, they found, as, as soon as they had done testing, that these chemicals had contaminated the town drinking water as well. And of course, it's not just Petersburg. Thanks to Rob Allott, an activist in Parkersburg, West Virginia, we know all about DuPont's decades-long efforts to hide the dangers of PFOA and convince regulators to turn a blind eye. And in North Bennington, where the government response set the gold standard, getting boots on the ground to do testing the very same day this, they suspected contamination, St. Cobain has sued the state over its drinking water advisory. Sometimes it feels like things just couldn't get any worse than they are. Uh, but the truth is they might. Our new chief of the Environmental Protection Agency <laughs> has made his political career out of suing the very agency that he now leads and recently reiterated support for eliminating the agency altogether. And our new president has proposed, of course, $2 billion in budget cuts at EPA threatening to roll back every shred of progress that we have made over the past decade. So where do we go from here? Um, it feels easy to look at that dysfunction down in Washington, D.C., the, the bitter divisions that surfaced around last fall's election, rollbacks that assault our most core values, and throw up our hands in despair, believing that change isn't possible. But the most important thing that we've learned over the years of doing this work at Toxic Action Center is that even in the face of powerful special interests, government inertia, even corrupt politicians, when neighbors join together around common goals, build groups, organize, and build community, we can win. The media is talking on and on about how hard it is right now for Americans of different kinds to come together. At Toxic Action Center, we know that community organizing works, that this is exactly how people join together across difference and find common ground. We've been doing this together for the last 30 years, and our work has always been based around the idea that these hard times can bring us together to spur political action, that neighbors banding together, drawing lines between right and wrong, uh, can bring us closer to our vision of clean air and clean water, healthy and vibrant communities, and a government that works democratically on behalf of all of its citizens. And we see this in every day and in every place that we work. In New Hampshire, people of all political stripes came together, um, and all different class backgrounds came together in, from 17 communities in recent years to stop a pipeline proposal. 
um, a group whose leaders included a lawyer, a climate activist, a llama farmer, and a grandmother motorcycle aficionado. <laughs> Many of these same individuals are now helping to fight for clean water in Litchfield, Merrimack, and Bedford. And this is part of what really gives me hope in this challenging time because I think that this approach of organizing communities and bringing people together across difference is an antidote to the challenges that we face. And in my mind, that's what this conference is all about. People are certainly here for a lot of different reasons, but the reason why I'm here is to support and strengthen the grassroots, bottom-up, community organizing efforts happening all across the country to win clean water and change the paradigm on PFAS. It's about, uh, this conference is about Joe Kiger and Keep Your Promises DuPont, who've taken on one of the most powerful chemical corporations in the world. It's about Andrea Miko, Elena Davis, and Michelle Dalton from Testing for Peace, who've run such a sophisticated communications campaign in Portland, New Hampshire. They brought the Air Force to the table. <laughs> it's about Hope Gross and Joanne Stanton, from, uh, and other neighbors in Warminster, Pennsylvania, campaigning for the Navy to clean up one of the most contaminated sites in the country. It is about Cindy Ashbeck and the Veterans and Civilians Clean Water Alliance, building a diverse coalition to hold our government accountable. This conference is for all of you. It's um, the critical work that you're doing in your communities, attending late night public hearings, speaking out in the face of corporate bullying, knocking on doors, phone glued to your ear, this work is what will make change happen. Not a scientific study or even a mountain of scientific evidence will be enough, unfortunately. Um, it's your community organizing that will build the people-powered movement that we need to win on these issues. And so the next two days are, are really um, for us to be present here together to share our stories and sharpen our knowledge and skills, build connections and get inspired to go back out into our communities and do this work. And um, for community activists from impacted communities, like Phil mentioned, we have some closed sessions, which are working meals, unfortunately. There just wasn't a lot of other time around the edges. But lunch today and dinner tonight, we'll be meeting in room 440. And um, so definitely go straight to grab food at lunch and take the elevator or stairs to go upstairs. We'll meet again at dinner, so we'll have time to meet one another, to share strategies. Um, and to, to chart a path forward for how we can support the efforts that are going on all around the country. And um, if you're a scientist or an attorney or an environmental advocate, these communities need your help. At Toxics Action Center, we are working with the Boston University School of Public Health Superfund program to actually uh, build a database of technical experts willing to help communities facing PFAS contamination. So uh, if you want to take a look at the database, it's the Health and Environment Assistance Resources Database h-e-a-r-db.org or find one of our staff from Tax Action Center to sign up. And um, for all of you, I just, I can't thank you enough for being here and for your courageous work. Thank you so much. Program. She is a board-certified toxicologist and has served as a federal scientist for over 37 years at both the EPA and NIEHS. Dr. Birnbaum is a former president of the Society of Toxicology, which is the largest professional organization of toxicologists in the world. She is the author of more than 800 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and reports and is an adjunct professor at several universities, including Duke University and the University of North Carolina. Dr. Birnbaum has received many awards and recognitions for her exceptional work, including being elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. She has received the Women in Toxicology Elsevier Mentoring Award and the EPA Health Science Achievement Award. 
Dr. Birnbaum's research focuses on the pharmacokinetic behavior of the environmental chemicals, mechanisms of action of toxicants, including endocrine disruptors, and leading, excuse me, leading the real-world exposure to health effects. In particular for our conference here, Dr. Birnbaum has been a leader in advancing the science of PFASs as well as translating it into everyday world. Um, for example, working with furniture manufacturers to change product formulation to be one that is more health friendly. Most recently, Dr. Birnbaum has been heavily involved in working with New York Senator Gilbrand in support of PFOA research of Hoxic Falls and Petersburg. Last July, Dr. Birnbaum came here to Northeastern University to visit with the Superfund Research Program in Children's Environmental Health Center and gave a very well-attended public lecture. We are honored to welcome back Dr. Birnbaum to Northeastern University today. So, um, first of all, thank you all. Michelle, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I'll give myself all. And I'm going to be able to go very, very quickly through some of the beginning of my slides because we've already heard um, some of the facts. Some of them are identical to the ones that we've already, that Laurel, that Laurel show. But I just did want to mention that working with PFAS is nothing new for me. I actually published three papers in the 1980s where I was looking at the C10 um, carboxylic acid, PFDA, and I showed at that time that only a 10-day exposure in utero was associated with a reduction in fetal weight at 0.1 mg per kg, which is in, you know, a very, very low dose to the animals. Um, and that work was all published, as I said, in 1989. And it's like what goes around comes around. So I just wanted to show um, a little bit about some of the changes in production that are going on with some of the perfluorinated compounds. And one of the points that really here is, well, we may have really not are producing as much as we did here in the U.S., look what's happening in China. And of course what we all know is that, you know, global is local, and whatever is produced in China ends up here in a relatively short amount of time. If it's emitted into the air, it's only four or five days before it hits California. Um, and so we, we need to be aware that it's not only what we can do in this country, but has implications for what we need to do worldwide. Now, there are a whole bunch of chemicals of concern, and we're going to be focusing on the perfluorinates today. But I just want to remind you, remind you that <coughs> sort of like the perfluorinate is we're still dealing with the legacy of PCBs. And we're going to be dealing with the legacy of the perfluorinated compounds, not for the next 10 or 15, but for the next 100 or more years. Um, you know, 70% of the PCBs that were ever made, these were banned in 1977. In the U.S. are still out there. Certain things are never going to go, go away. You know, mercury is a natural element, okay? And it gets converted into highly toxic forms. Um, arsenic is, in, is up there. For example, pesticides, how to put a dioxin, since that's one of my favorites. But again, we all carry a legacy burden of it. But what we want to talk again about today is the per and the per cloud. Per, um, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. And again, we've had a really good introduction from, um, about this from Laurel, that you know the PFOAs and the PFOSs and the structures on the bottom, Laurel can show the same thing. And the point is that, that we really need to make, we may have these 3,000, in fact, I'm hearing from some of my EPA colleagues, there may be more like 6,000 different perfluorinated compounds that you can actually find out there in the environment. Many of them actually break down to give you PFOA and PFAS, that these are the terminal breakdown products. So in the atmosphere, you end up going to PFOA and PFAS, and the PFOA and PFAS essentially are never going to go away um, in our environments. So again, we've heard some of the introduction for the levels of PFOA and PFAS, that the U.S. production of these two, um, negotiated PFOA, PFAS was really uh, 3M was the sole U.S. manufacturer and stopped making it in 2002, but of course we still have it. PFOA, we have this voluntary reduction, is no longer being made, but again, still out there. Um, and, and we saw that the very slow half-lives in human. The point I wanted to make at the bottom is that while, for example, the actual um, uh, levels in people of PFOA and PFOS have gone down somewhat since large production stopped, it's not going to go to zero because it's still out there in the environment, so it's still going to be recycling, um, as well as I said, that they would have the right-down products. So, we can 
contaminated communities across the U.S. And these are just a couple of recent headlines um, in the papers, so you see who's in falls up there. Um, up, in, in, up in your right-hand top corner, that the CFPUA, that's North Carolina, my state, has huge productions. Um, that Gen X that was shown before is made in tremendous quantities, released into the F.A. fill into the Cape Fear River, and we've got really high levels of contamination, and Andy Lindstrom is here and can fill in on um, the, the very high P, um, P, P, PFAS contamination we have. But the point is, is, is when EPA gave that new advisory level of the total of 70 parts per trillion of PFOA plus PFAS in drinking water, at that point they said there are 6 million Americans who are exposed based upon, above at 70 or above based upon that new advisory limit. But we now know from, again, some of the work that's just come out from Northeastern that there may be many, many more people than that um, exposed, maybe not to the regulatory limit, some may be lower than that, but they're still being exposed. And since these are chemicals that build up in our bodies, what you, what you are today is a reflection of what you've been for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years or more. And I think that's something important to remember. So this is just a little bit data, Michelle, from Peace, um, just showing that your levels are elevated, your blood levels for PFAS, PFOA. And I thought it was really interesting, the PFHXS, because that C6 is something that has been a major replacement for PFAS. And at least we've been told that, oh, this one doesn't high accumulate, and this one isn't toxic. And the answer is, I have a bridge in Brooklyn if you want to buy. Um, it's the same kind of thing. And we are seeing that increasing in the population. Um, these are just some examples around the Air Force bases. And we, we know from um, some of the work that the uh, firefighting foams, the AFFFs. So anywhere you have an Air Force base, you are likely to have elevated um, levels. And then this slide that was just um, recently shown, um, I think is very important for seeing water sheds where you have a point source, you're going to have higher detection frequencies. And again, while our focus at this meeting, um, and we're talking a lot about point sources leading to contamination, you can also have non-point sources, for example, from the biosolid application and so on, which can also lead to contamination. So just, just a nice little slide to look at the exposure pathways, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the complexity of the exposure. Obviously, since these are totally synthetic chemicals, there is no natural production of PFAS, unlike, for example, some of the dioxins, which can be produced by volcanoes and forest fires. Okay. Um, the, the, for example, the PFAS are being an industrial product, and they're released into the environment, and then they can circulate many ways and get into people. And again, we're focusing on drinking water as a major route of exposure here. I want to remind you that there are other routes of exposure, such as food. So um, the study that was released last year showing the fluorinated compounds in fast food packaging, I think is important that at least half of the fast food packaging that was looked at had elevated levels. Again, Laurel showed us some more data about that. But the point is, is this going to also have an issue related to environmental justice? Are we going to have our um, people who are most disadvantaged, most exposed because of this route of exposure? And we really have, haven't done very much looking at food as a major source of exposure. And this, is, this is where it migrates from the packaging into the food. But I would tell you that also, for example, fish that are happily swimming in water supplies that contaminate are also going to be contaminated. And at this point, there are no fish advisories based on perfluorinated um, contamination of fish, which is something we should be think begin to be thinking about. So we're going to have a whole session in a little while about the wide range of health effects of PFAS. And this is just giving you an example of some of them. Um, I mean, have your pick. Testicular cancer, cancer kidney cancer, GI effects. Um, Lipid is a clear target, so there's often high cholesterol, hypertension um, during pregnancy, impacts on the thyroid gland, other hormonal changes that impacts on liver, um, obesity, immunotoxicity, and I'm going to come back to the immunotoxic effects, um, lower birth weight and size, delayed puberty, decreased fertility, early menopause, reduced testosterone, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. What else would you like to throw in the mix? I mean, this is kind of a multi which target carcinogen and toxicant, you know, depending upon who it affects, when it affects you, you know, where it affects you, you may have different, different responses, but there's a very, very wide uh, body of responses that have been seen. 
So um, Phil asked me to talk about, for example, how does the NIDHS decide what it wants to spend its $800 million budget on? Um, and I should say that we are very thankful that we did not get any cuts this year. We got a very tiny increase. Um, projections for NIH as a whole next year is a 27%. The, the request in the President's budget is for a 27% decrease in funding. We don't think that's going to happen. Um, we're pretty confident it's not going to happen, but we don't know whether we might get Thank you for some cuts. Um, it's very important that we, that we can all educate our representatives to the important work that gets done. But anyhow, we have a strategic plan which has many, um, I, I often call, call kind of the rotating thing because you can't do environmental health sciences without doing it in a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary way. You can't do it without getting the communities involved. You have to go all the way from the basic sciences to the translational sciences and exposure. We have to deal with our disadvantaged communities and our global um, interactions, and we have to, um, you know, all, as I said, all work together. Now, there are kind of different kinds of work that we have. We have much of our grants program, which, like any NIH institute, is uh, the largest part of our funding, and much of that is investigator-initiated research, where we receive grant proposals and then fund them. We also fund a lot of centers in order to have a more coordinated effort as well. Um, the National Toxicology Program, which is a cross-agency um, organization headquartered at NIHS, but also involves parts of CDC and FDA, works by nominations. And the nominations can come from anybody. So we have nominations from individual citizens, we have nominations from industry, we have nominations from other parts of government, we have nominations from advocacy groups. If you see things that you want studied, for, you know, tested for what their impacts may be, just go on our website and there's a nomination form and fill it out um, and we'll be looking at it. We also get information from our government partners, for example, so the NHANES data that provides biomonitoring information that tells us <laughs> what levels are of things that we know about. And of course, we have a whole effort under our exposure and exposome program of trying to understand what's out there that we don't know about. Because when you do biomonitoring, you're looking under the lamppost. You're saying, what is present? You know, this is what I know and this is what I look at. Well, how do we know that all those other things that we don't know about might like, not be having an impact? So we're doing agnostic approaches as well to monitoring. And as I said, we work with our agency partners. Now, currently we are funding about $10 million a year in work involving the um, perfluorinated compounds. Um, I don't think that the alphabet soup here is very helpful for you, unless you're a grantee, and then you know that, you know, you know the PO1s and the RO1s are basically investigator, are all investigator initiated. The P42s are Superfund Center, we have one here, for example, at Northeastern. Um, and then, for example, the UO1 is a collaborative agree uh, agreements in which uh, the grantee works closely with, with their federal partners in order to um, conduct their research. So at the moment, we're funding about 32 different grants looking at perfluorinated compounds. And they have a wide range of topics that many of them are dealing with um, human sources and effects. In fact, the, the majority where we're looking at exposure from water, house dust, and diet, and looking at a variety of endpoints. And these are all things that I mentioned in that long list, in, impacts on birth weight, fertility reproduction, and so on, endocrine disruption. Um, some studies looking, um, for example, there, there have been a number of studies that have shown association between elevated in utero exposure to perfluorinated compounds and ADHD, for example. Cardiovascular disease and immune outcomes. In our animal systems, we are studying not only rats and mice, but we're also doing lots with zebrafish. And for those of you who are not into the field, I can tell you zebrafish are a great animal model to be using. You can study them. Indi individual zebrafish, the first five days of their development, they are totally transparent. And so you can actually watch the heart forming, the brain forming. It's very, very, very cool. And again, you can look individually. We can put 396 zebrafish, one into each well of a plate, and quantitatively measure what's happening um, with a large number of samples. And they are vertebrates. 
so that we can look at a lot of the same things that we can in ourselves. Nature is very, very good. <coughs> we also do a lot of in vitro studies, and I'm going to come back and mention some of those later as well. Looking at a whole number of endpoints, but we are looking at, in our animal studies of cancer and genotoxicity in vitro, looking at things like uh, gene expression changes and signaling pathways and so on. So uh, some of the our grants that we're looking at to examine perfluorinated compounds um, and looking at the health, we have a large study, which is a prospective longitudinal study. It's a birth cohort that was started in Cincinnati. This is largely a study involving Caucasian um, mothers and children, but we've been following them now. The these, these studies started about almost um, 10 years ago, and we have 400 infant mother pairs, and we're looking at developmental and behavioral outcomes, and we're looking at the association with PFOA and PFAS and some other um, perfluorinated compounds in that case. In the Healthy Start study, which we have some of our grantees are involved with, although it's largely funded by the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive Diseases, and Kidneys, is, has an ethnic, ethnically diverse cohort of 800 mother infant pairs in multiple sites across the country, and is looking at metabolic and behavioral factors during pregnancy. And the MARVELS is, is really a terrific study. This is being um, conducted at UC Davis, and our grantees there, and in this, um, Autism, as you probably know, now uh, the prevalence of 68 children um, has somewhere on the autism spectrum, and there are about four to four and a half times more boys and girls that are impacted. So that should be telling us something about the mechanisms, <laughs> but we haven't gotten very far really to understanding that. But the point is, if you have one child on the spectrum, you have a 10 to 20 percent chance that your another child will be on the spectrum. So that we, we, Royal We, this is actually out of UC Davis and the Mind Institute, they've recruited um, women who already have a child with autism and then are, are following not only that child's development, but they are following subsequent pregnancies so that they can actually measure what exposures are in the mother, you know, and this child has autism and this child doesn't. Um, so it's, again, it's a longitudinal cohort. I have to say, these longitudinal perspective cohorts are incredibly powerful. You can really get to cause and effect with epidemiology. A cross-sectional study only tells you that there's an association and really generates a hypothesis for testing. But it can't really show you that the exposure has caused the effect. You could just say they're happening at the same time in cross-sectional. So in, this, in the Marvel study, it's a very powerful study, and we are learning that certain things are playing, are highly associated with the risk of autism. Um, we also have the SWAN study, which is a, a longitudinal study sponsored not only by NIA, but the National Institute of Nursing um, Research and the Office of Women's Health Research at NIA. But this is, again, a longitudinal study of 3,000 ethnically diverse women starting recruitment in the mid-90s, and these women continue to be followed. And the, we're looking at the association in, in following up with perfluorinated compounds there. Now, some of the most powerful studies, and again, I'm just going to keep talking about these longitudinal studies, are the Faroe Islands birth cohorts. I don't know if any of you, how many of you know where the Faroe <coughs> Islands are, but they're kind of a speck of land between Scotland, somewhere <coughs> off Scotland, but they're part of Denmark, actually. Um, they're up there in the North Sea. Um, they are about 50,000 people, um, Danish, and um, by, Danish by ethnicity as well as um, uh, heritage and government. But they uh, tend to survive on pilot whale and fish. Um, is, that's their, their subsistence, or have been traditionally subsistence. And Philippe Grandjean from Harvard had begun recruiting um, mothers and, and uh, during pregnancy in the late 1980s, and he has continued to recruit. So he has a whole series of <coughs> cohorts that, and that he has been following. The oldest children in some of these cohorts are no longer children, they're in their mid to late 20s, and continuing to follow them. And he's been able to show associations with um, methyl mercury, associations with PCBs, and now associations where he's been focusing on the perfluorinated compounds. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I'll show you some of the, the fact that he's been the one who was the first one to really show the immune suppression in the children associated with their mother's exposure um, to, to, to both PFOA and PFAS. And what, when I say immune suppression, about 20%, the children whose mothers were in the top 20% of the population related to PFOA and PFAS 
were not able to mount a normal antibody response to vaccinations. So I think we have to ask the question when sometimes we see, um, we hear about an outbreak of measles or whooping cough somewhere, before we automatically assume that these children weren't vaccinated, we might want to ask the question, well, had they been exposed in utero to something that has blocked their ability to mount a normal immune response? Project Viva is a study that's going on right here, actually in South Boston, but it's a, a longitudinal birth cohort. Um, again, run out of largely largely run out of Harvard, and looking at prenatal child health and neurodevelopment, um, and again looking at the perfluorinated compounds in them. Now, to go back to the immunotoxicity issue, um, NTP is doing some things that are called systematic review. And systematic reviews have been around for a long time in clinical medicine um, because you know what you gave someone and you can follow what happens. You can do a, a controlled intervention trial. When you do environmental health, it's very rare that we can actually do a clinical trial. We're not going to intentionally expose something to people to something that we know is bad. Occasionally, like with air pollution, we can remove people from a hazardous place and see what happens to their health. That's a good kind of intervention. But usually in um, environmental health studies, we have epidemiology studies, which are observational human studies. So we can't control for everything. We do the best that we can. We have animal studies, and we have mechanistic studies using, for example, um, cells or even computational modeling and that kind of thing. And so NTP is developing an approach where you can combine all these lines of data um, and come up with basically uh, statements about levels of confidence in the data and what the totality of the data is telling you. Unfortunately, some of our regulatory agencies only want, there are some that only want to see the animal data and they ignore the human data and there are some other groups that only want to use the human data and ignore the animal data. And how much more powerful when we can combine all the information. So that NTP uh, last summer had peer reviewed um, and has released a monograph on the immunotoxicity ex associated with exposure to PFOA and PFAS. And in these studies, they based it upon, they looked at all the data that they can find in human studies, in animal <coughs> studies, and in mechanistic studies. And basically came up with conclusions for both PFOA and PFOS that, um, that they are both uh, presumed to be immune hazards for humans. So the data is, the level of confidence in the data and uh, the level of the evidence for P, um, PFOA is very, very high <coughs> in animals and has meet moderate um, confidence basically in the human studies. But the antibody response, and I already mentioned that to you related to the Faroe Islands cohort and the PFOA and the vaccination response, but also there's some, some pretty good evidence, very good evidence in animals, but not, we don't have the data. People haven't looked as much in humans related to an association between PFOA and asthma. Um, and again, much of this is focusing on early life exposure. So putting it all together, the conclusion was that PFOA is presumed to be an immune hazard to humans. And so is PFAS. But PFAS, again, the data is, is strong related to the suppression of the primary immune response, so lack of ability to, to um, respond to vaccination well um, in both the animal studies and the human studies, but we don't have any data there really related to the asthma or the hypersensitivity kind of response. So it isn't that the data is negative, it just isn't there. People haven't looked, the questions haven't been asked. So, but it's clear, I believe, that PFOA and PFAS are both having impacts on the immune system of humans. So then the other kinds of studies that we're looking at, the NTP is also looking at um, a whole number, about seven different perfluorinated compounds. You have the list up there um, for TOX21. TOX21 is the high throughput screening where instead of looking at just a few chemicals and a few different kinds of responses in an in vitro um, setting, we can look at many. And in this case, we've run 43 different toxicity assays and assays for activation of nuclear receptors. Um, the data is currently being analyzed for, for this, so stay put. Um, we, NTP is busy studying all of those chemicals as a, program, as a class, and they're trying to look at the toxicity and the carcinogenicity of PFOA, the toxic <coughs> kinetics of a number, those of the PFAS in the Harlan spray dog rat, 
and looking at it also by in vitro and in vivo uh, models. And I think an important thing here, um, we've already talked about the persistence, for example, of many of the PFASs, both in the environment and in the body. So you really need to know what's in the body, what's the blood level or what's the tissue level, um, not just what the administered dose. I've, I've had a really hard time for the last 30 some years um, helping people understand that when you do animal studies, you have to use a higher delivered dose, so higher, say, drinking water concentration, than people are drinking in order to get the same internal dose. And that's because small animals metabolize chemicals much more and get rid of them more rapidly than big animals, simply. So, you know, often you'll say, oh, the dose to the animals is so, so high. Well, you gotta look at the internal dose, what actually is in the animal, and often it's not so high. So some of the ongoing NTP studies, we're doing actually a two-year bioassay for the carcinogenicity of PFOA, where we're actually comparing an in utero exposure and then the rest of the life with no in utero exposure. Because there's growing evidence that, um, I've actually made the comment that I'm amazed that NTP has done 600 um, carcinogenicity studies and that we found so many that are positive, given the fact that until eight years ago or nine years ago when I came, we were only starting exposures in adults. Well, the critical windows of susceptibility for many things are during development. You know, by the time you get to be an adult, at least a young adult, you're pretty stable. Um, hopefully. Anyway. Um, so those things are currently undergoing review, and we expect the pathology tables, the completely peer-reviewed pathology tables, to be posted this summer and the full report out next year. We're also doing four-week studies to look, compare the toxicity and the internal dose of those seven perfluorinateds that I mentioned. Um, and again, that data is, is currently under analysis. We're also looking at the toxicokinetic studies of all the chemicals, um, including the A2 fluorotelomere, which is important, and those are being analyzed. The immunotox assessment is actually pretty interesting, and PFDA is the, uh, the chemical that I actually studied in the 1980s. And, um, Again, they are finding that the PFDA is as immunotoxic as PFOA, um, or not, or possibly even more toxic. And, and uh, some of that information was presented at the Society of Toxicology meeting last March. And then there are a number of in vitro studies that have been published showing the, uh, per, the mitochondrial toxicity and the immunotoxicity, and then some of the neurotoxicity that, uh, that is shown um, of these compounds. So some, right now, there are a bunch of um, studies focusing on the early life PFOA exposure, and we're seeing um, that there's enhanced weight gain at low doses and reduced weight gain at high doses. Now, this is what we call a non-monotonic dose response curve, and for a long time, people said, oh, that can't happen. You know, you, know, you can't go one direction and then another direction. The point is different things happen at different doses, and you have different mechanisms. And something like weight gain is a really uh, gross, no, that's the wrong word, really, uh, <laughs> a really, I mean, it's, it's a phenotypic endpoint that, that doesn't really tell you how you got there. And there are many different ways. You can have an animal gain weight because it ate too much. You can have an animal gain weight because that is edema. Completely different mechanisms, and yet both may have adverse effects. But what you find here is that at very low doses, the animals, um, you know, this is a utero exposure. But then later on, they, they may get fat. Um, there's also impacts on the liver, and that's been known for this whole class of compounds for a very long time. Impacts on, um, on, on tumors and inflammation. One of the things I want to mention about tumors is for a long time, we were told that PFOA caused liver tumors, and that was due to interaction with a specific receptor protein called PPAR-alpha, and that causes peroxisome proliferation. And if you didn't have peroxisome proliferation, you weren't gonna get tumors. Well, the answer is wrong. Because in <laughs> fact, if you take mice and you remove the PPAR-alpha receptor, you genetically make a PPAR knockout mouse, and then you treat it, you still get tumors. You don't get as many liver tumors, but you still do get liver tumors. And we now know that, that as many, many chemicals don't impact just one nuclear receptor. Receptors are not, we used to talk about a lock and key and think it was very specific. In fact, they're not. 
They're pretty sloppy. And chemicals can often impact multiple nuclear receptors. And so we know that, for example, that the perfluorinated compounds not only bind to PPAR, PPAR alpha, they bind to PPAR gamma, which is a receptor involved in diabetes, in the diabetes diabetogenic response, as well as some of the other um, nuclear receptors. So I just wanted to make the point that, that uh, cancer is not, does not require the PPAR alpha receptor, and, um, and neither does hepatocellular hypertrophy, so for example. And then we'll also see impacts on behavioral changes. Um, we know that, and this is really important, um, PFOA is transferred to the offspring, not only transplacentally, but is also transferred then um, after birth via the milk. And not only can we actually, uh, Sue Fenton has actually milked um, mice and rats and measured the PFOA in them, but we also have done studies looking at mother's milk and found high concentrations of PFOA in um, mother's milk. Um, we also know that at high doses of these compounds, you can actually um, block lactation altogether. And I'm, I'm going to show you some of the data. And then some of that's because these compounds are screwing up mammary gland development. So if in, in utero exposure, you end up with a mammary gland that is not normal. And Sue Fenton and I, it has, has really been the leader in this field um, and developed many different assays and different approaches. But what you can show is that the mammary gland is uniquely susceptible, exquisitely susceptible to these, um, these chemicals. And this study, this table I think is just important because what it shows, whoops, I didn't want to go ahead there yet, is that the, the, um, the PFOA um, associated with the mammary gland effects, the concentrations, and this actually shows days after the PFOA dosing ended, so it gives you some idea of the half-life, for example, in the mice. But the concentrations here, in which we're seeing mammary glands effects in the mice, as low as, for example, 0.1 milligram per kilogram dose, for example, look at the concentrations and look at the serum levels that we're seeing in the Ohio Valley children um, and, and their serum levels. Certainly within the same range. For example, children 2 to 5, 600 nanograms per mil. Well, that's, that's up at the high levels, you know, or the, the the bolus levels, for example, of exposure, but even lower. And I guess one other thing that's interesting here that I just want to point out, when we look at the levels in, in the children, you can see that the highest levels are in the youngest children. I published a paper about 10 years ago where we just were looking at blood levels of um, eight different um, PFAS, and again, showed the same kind of thing, and that was just in a random sample kind of children from Dallas, Texas, uh, with, where we happen to have the serum. But, the, the highest levels were in the youngest children. And part of that is related to lactational transfer. Part of it may be related to in utero exposure as well. So this is just a, I, I, I'm a scientist, guys. That I may, people may think of me that I have to administrate a big program, but at the same point, I love the science. And just to show you the difference between what, um, um, what, what, what we're seeing in a, a duct um, in the mammary gland, in a mouse that was exposed to a mg per kg of um, PFOA. And what you can see is a total change in the structure um, at that level. And then this is another um, looking at the difference in the size of the animals. Remember I said that PFOA can cause early, a, a, can impact the size of the animals. And we see that in our animals so that, for example, at the low dose, you get an increase in body weight. And then at the higher doses, you don't see that again. So the non-monotonic dose response curve. So some of the work that's been done by Sue Fenton um, of NIHS has shown again that the lower birth weights following PFOA exposure, and we see that in not only in animals but in children, that the fact that then later as they grow, by the time they're about 90 days of age, they tend to overgrow and become overweight. And we're seeing that in epidemiological studies. Um, we're seeing and it's maybe because of an impact on mammary glands in people as well. But we're seeing in humans that people who have higher, women who have higher P, um, PFAS levels nurse for a shorter period of time. And whether that's because they have difficulty nursing, um, we really don't know, but it's a hypothesis. We are beginning to use this mammary data in risk evaluation. So we heard how New Jersey has actually pointed up how sensitive the, um, the mammary gland is to, to effects. 
And I think all the liver data that we've seen it shows that and the liver data in the knockout mice shows the human relevance um, of the effects. We're continuing to do some more work on, now uncharacterized is, is the wrong word, but a P, PFAS that we've defined the structure, but we don't know very much about how much, um, you know, who's making them and so on. But we're looking at these and looking at the effects on adipocytes uh, for liver production. We're looking at the metabolism by the liver. We're looking at hepatic effects more generally in vitro. And we're looking at the placenta, because that appears to be the placental control of energy and the transport across the placenta appears to be very important in exposing the fetus. Um, and once we identify which of these 22 are the most active, then we'll be going into some animal studies as well. So um, another thing we do is we work with many of our, um, our colleagues, and I mentioned biomonitoring, and Haynes is currently monitoring 16 different perfluorinated compounds in the blood of people, um, a large number. We've, we've, um, we're also ATSDR, which is affiliated with CDC, um, is looking at, is beginning to do health assessments at sites where there are um, elevated uh, PFAS in the groundwater. So they're, they're, they're doing health assessments at a number of them, and we're, we're working very closely with them on, on, their, um, on these studies. Uh, we've already heard about the Madrid Statement that was fostered by the Green Policy Science Institute. And I think um, I have to say, while I was initially not such a fan of these class approaches, I've become one because we can't test our way out of, of 3,000 or 6,000 different chemicals. We have to have an approach. And frankly, every perfluorinated compound that has been studied has, is causing problems. So I don't know of any that are totally innocuous. And they all, even if they have a shorter half-life, I'll tell you, a half-life in people of 30 days is not a short half-life. You know, and, and so that means if it's a half-life of 30 days, it's going to build up in your lives. You know, especially if you have ongoing exposure. And the other point is, is even if that's a short half-life in the people, in the environment, that's not going to go away. And if you have ongoing exposure to things, even if the half-life is sh short, you may still have adverse effects. Um, we've seen several slides about acceptable levels, and I think, I mean, I was very pleased when EPA dropped what it considered um, an acceptable level to 70 parts per trillion um, in May of 2016. That was much better than 400. Would I like to see it go lower? Yes. But I was happy that at least they said it didn't have to be just PFAS or just PFOA. It was if the sum was that. So that was moving in the right direction. Um, some of our states have lower levels, and I, I guess I didn't realize that New Jersey was talking about 14. That's terrific. Um, Vermont is down at 20, which is great. Um, and I love this quote from the Minnesota, the Minnesota um, Health Condition, Commissioner that we are on the side of caution, and that's sort of the tradition we have here in Minnesota to really protect the most vulnerable as best we can. And so, the question is, is PFAS, PFOA replacements? Well, I think I've already kind of made the point that I don't think they're necessarily better. We tend to go from one get bad chemical to another one that we know less about until we start studying it. I mean, the, the new, some of the new perfluorinated compounds are equally persistent. Uh, their toxicity, we really don't know much if they're less toxic or not. We know very little about how well they're taken up or where they go. Um, and we know, and we saw some data a little bit before, that many of, for example, the shorter chain ones are not removed by carbon filtration um, in your water system. So that's an, another problem that they're going to be harder to actually get rid of. So NIEHS and NTP are working very closely with all of our federal partners. Um, we've actually been having a series of meetings and calls to have a coordinated research approach and to make sure the information is shared. We're also working very closely with the Department of Defense because the Department of Defense has all the Army and Air Force and Marine bases and stuff where lots of the AFFF have been used and our issue. So with that, I say thank you very much. We are redoing our strategic plan. It's been five years unbelievably, so we're starting again. We're looking for your great ideas. Um, if you go on our website, we'd be very happy if you give us any of your ideas for future work. So thank you very much.
Um, I will be, I'm going to be here almost for the entire meeting. I'm, you know, when they tell me I can do science, it's like, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you.